Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Here in the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we never lose sight of the fact that our equitable radio messages go into millions of homes. Because of this, we feel that it is our responsibility to key these equitable commercials to home and family problems. Tonight's message concerns education. Are there young children in your home? Then you'll be interested in getting the facts on the Equitable Education Fund. For full details, listen carefully in just 15 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Melancholy Mind Reader. More than a million and a half major crimes are committed in the United States every year. And they are committed for a variety of reasons. Some are the result of passion or temper and are usually unpremeditated. Some are the result of an overwhelming desire for revenge. But for the most part, crimes are committed because the criminal is overcome with greed. That type cannot wait until he has earned what he desires because waiting, to his point of view, is needless. Take what you want when you want it, is his personal credo. And in order to live up to that, he will stop at nothing. Not even murder. Tonight's FBI file opens on the grounds of a large carnival that's playing an engagement in a Midwestern city. A stroll along the midway reveals the usual assortment of candy butchers, drink purveyors, pitchmen, and, oh yes, the mind reader. His tent, larger than the rest, bears a huge sign reading Carrie, the Mental Marvel. In the rear of this tent in the living quarters, Carrie, the Mental Marvel, in person, reclines on a cot. His wife is discussing his work. That was a great little show you just did. Great. What, baby? I'm talking about your performance. It's a wonder we weren't booed off the stage. Oh? Look, will you put down that bottle for a minute and listen to me? Go ahead, May. Do you realize what a fool you made of yourself out there tonight? And what a bigger fool you made of me? Oh. You were so drunk you blew 50% of the answers. That's many? Yes, that many. I have an object here in my hand. It belongs to someone near and dear to the owner. Identify the object, please. What do you come up with? A black sedan. Got a laugh, didn't I? Oh, what's the use? Look, baby, quit steaming, huh? Just a two-bit carny. Who cares how we do? You'd better care. And you'd better start right now. Whether you realize it or not, kid, this is last stand Nebraska for you. Well, thanks. And I mean it. You and that bottle have taken us down a real fast slide. May, you'd better change that billing. 
What do you mean? Put yourself in that act. What are you talking about? You're the little girl that brought me and the bottle together. Are you kidding? Just think back, May. It adds up awful easy. Oh, you're not going to start that old routine again. How I've run around with other guys. How I made a sucker out of you. How I drove you to drink. Honey, that's every drunk's excuse since bums laid on their backs and squeezed it out of grape. In my case, it happens to be true. Huh? I can prove it to you, May. I can show you where I... Uh... Wait. Lancaster's on. Yeah, the great Lancaster. He is great. He's magnificent. Look at him. Watch him ride that motorcycle on nothing but a wire. There he goes. Sure, May. Come ahead. Aren't you through packing? Oh, just about. When does the train leave? About an hour. I thought you were wonderful tonight, honey. You watched? Yeah. Scared to death, too. About me? Yeah. You mean that I'd miss? Mm-hmm. Hey, look, sweetheart. I ain't blown a trick in five years. Oh, Roy. When that motorcycle turns upside down in the air, my heart does the same thing. <laughs> I just can't help it. That's on account of the guy who's riding it. Am I right? You are right. Come here. How'd you get away so early? We didn't do our last show. How come? Frank was fractured. Oh. I thought he was on the wagon. He was for a fast five minutes. He started drinking again this morning. Oh, May, why do you put up with that guy? He's the only wheel in town. That ain't so. You got to deal with me, honey, anytime you want it. What would that prove? Hey, look, you go for me, don't you? Sure. Well, then why ain't we together? Because I made a little deal with myself. The only move I make is in the direction of money. Well, that don't belt me off. I'm afraid it does, Roy. I get a hundred a week from this outfit. And look at my billing. I'm talking about real money. In lumps. Is that why you hooked up with Carrie? Mm Mm-hmm. That bum has money? Well, he did have when I met him. He was a big star then. Just my luck he started down the day I married him. Well, that could happen again. Oh, no, it couldn't. I'll be smarter with the next guy. Look, if I have to get dough to get you, I'll get dough. How? I don't know, and I don't care. But don't worry, I'll get it. Honey, if you really don't care where you get it, I think maybe I can help you out. Several days later, in an FBI field office, agent in charge Newton is just greeting a visitor. Sit down, Mr. Pomeroy. Thank you, sir. As I understand it, the local police sent you here. That's right. They told me that my case came under your jurisdiction. Yes, I've heard enough of the facts to believe it does. I wonder if you'd mind giving me the whole story. Well, as you already know, I'm the owner of a carnival called the Pomeroy Wonder Show. Yes. We just finished playing a week's engagement in Cleveland last night. I see. Then we packed and moved on here to Detroit. We have our own private train. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Sir, last night, somewhere between Cleveland and here, a money car was broken into. Safe was cracked and over $30,000 was taken. When did you discover this? Not till the train pulled in here this morning. Did you keep a watchman in the car? Yes. He was slugged from behind. He was still unconscious when I found him. He had no idea who gave it to him. Did you immediately notify the police? Yes, sir. They came right over, searched the car. They didn't seem to find any clues at all. I've sent one of our agents over to help them on the search. Good. You, uh, you say this was a special train, Mr. Pomeroy? Yes, sir. Nobody travels on it but our performers and crew. It's very likely, then, that this is an inside job. Mm -hmm. That's uh, how I feel. Have you checked to see if anyone is missing from the show? Yes, I did. Everybody is accounted for. Well, if a thorough search of the money car doesn't give us any clues, I'd like to assign an agent to your show. Give him a job. Let him mingle with the people. That'd be fine. I'll have to look in our avocation file for a man who'd be qualified for the job. Uh, Suppose you come back here this afternoon, Mr. Pomeroy. I'll have that agent ready. Roy, 
Hey, can I talk to you? Oh, yeah, sure, May. Come on over to my tent. Okay. I see you got your wire up early. Yeah. Pomeroy asked me to do an extra show. He's expecting big business. Oh. How's Carrie? Still drinking. Any work today? <laughs> Just about. Go ahead, May. Right. Roy, you did it. Yeah. How much did you get? Over 30000 Honey, honey, that's wonderful. Did you have any trouble? No, it was a breeze. I hear the watchman's in the hospital. He'll be okay. Oh, you're terrific. Where's the money? In that repair box. Well, that's no good. Well, I don't know what else to do with it. You got any ideas? You better let me take it. Well, where'll you put it? In with my costumes. Oh, but May, that's now, not look, a good Now, look, I lined this job up, didn't I? It was me that made it come off. Oh, yeah, but I took honey. all the... Let me handle the money, hmm? Oh, okay. I'll take it over to my tent right now. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? What's our next move? How long do we stick it out here? Not long. A few days at the most. Oh, now, May, we can't leave that soon. They'd know we have the money. Not the way I'm laying it out. What do you mean? Come to my tent after the show's over. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> Send for me, Mr. Newton. Oh, yes, Jim. Come on in. All right, sir. I'd like you to meet Mr. Pomeroy. Pomeroy, this is Special Agent Taylor. Hi, Mr. Taylor. How do you do, sir? Mr. Pomeroy is the owner of a carnival called the Pomeroy Wonder Show. Oh, yes, sir. Just reading a report on that. Then you know all the details on the robbery. Well, everything that's come in, yes, sir. Good. Is this the young man you had in mind, Mr. Newton? Yes. Uh, Jim. Sir? According to our vocation avocation file, you once worked for a carnival. That's right, sir. I worked one summer while I was on vacation in school. Uh, whose show was it? Paris Brothers. Oh, yeah. I know them well. What was your job at the show, Jim? Oh, I started out doing almost everything. But before the summer was over, I had a steady job spilling with a geek show. What in the world is a geek? That's a character who eats little tidbits like razor blades and broken light bulbs. Oh, yes. So that's what they're called. Were you a good spieler, Mr. Taylor? Well, the jury is still out on that one. Uh, give Mr. Pomeroy a sample, Jim. Oh, now, wait. I'm I... serious. If you qualify, I'll give you a job. Oh, I see. So you see us in the line of duty? Yes, sir. Uh, well, here goes. All right, step right up, folks. It's the new show, the thrill show, the biggest show on the Midway. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Young man, you can report to the lot tomorrow morning. You are hired. <laughs> Is that you, Frank? Yes, May. Well, where have you been? I just took a little walk. Uh, to that last show, I, I had to. I thought I was going to faint right on the stage, May. Yeah. I noticed you had the jumps pretty bad. Why don't you lie down? Huh? Stretch out. I'll get a cold cloth for your head. Well, thanks, May. Pomeroy was in here looking for you. Uh, what do you want? Well, he was pretty sore about the way you've been drinking, missing shows. Can't say I blame him. What'd you tell him? Said that you were very sorry, that you knew you'd been doing wrong, and was trying to straighten out. I am, May. I am trying. Sure. You know something? Mm -hmm. If you just keep on being like you are now, it's be the easiest thing in the world. I'll try, Frank. I'll try. Here's the cloth. Huh? Oh, well, that feels good. How many drinks have you had today? Uh, only half a dozen since noon. Pretty good, huh? Oh, honey, it's too good. What do you mean? I don't want you counting little pink things. You just can't stop that quickly. Well, I'm just trying to taper off. But you're going too fast. Here, have a drink. Well, uh, well you're the doctor. That's right. <coughs> Thanks. Honey, I've just been thinking about Mr. Pomeroy. Hmm? You know what you ought to do? What? Write him a little note, an apology note. That should help square things. All right, man. I'll do it first thing in the morning. Oh, Frank, I know you. If you're going to write it at all, you write it now. Yeah, but May, I... Put the paper right over here. Uh, very efficient woman. Here you are, dear. Just to spoil you completely, I'll even tell you what to say. Ah, gee, May. Uh, dear Mr. Pomeroy. Huh? Stop writing. Oh. oh. Uh, dear Mr. Pomeroy, I am sorry for what I did. Hmm. 
Got that? Uh, yeah. Um, I was drinking. I... Well, go uh, on, write it. I, uh, I'm trying to. Okay. Please forgive me. You got that? Please forgive me. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll just sign your name. Yeah. Is, is that all? Yeah, that's enough. Um, very well. May. What? May I? I feel funny. <laughs> really? I got a. <laughs> Can I come in? Huh? Oh, sure, Roy. Come ahead. Hiya, Carrie. Well, he's passed out, huh? No. He's dead. return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. How those grand old college songs take you back. Back on a magic carpet to ivy-covered walls and carefree college days. Yes, I'll never forget the good times I used to have. Ah, but you've got more than memories out of college, Ed. Those four years were worth money to you. Plenty of money. Do you realize that the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American? Of course, there are exceptions, people of outstanding ability who go far with very little education. But that doesn't alter the fact that college is the best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. Believe me, I hope there's nothing to prevent my kids from going. Nothing can prevent them, Ed, if you start an equitable education fund now. Equitable education fund? What's that? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. One... You start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him, right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Sounds swell, Mr. Keating. Whom do I see about starting one? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Melancholy Mind Reader. Criminals, in the very nature of their business, are professional optimists. Because despite the overwhelming evidence to prove that criminals do not escape the web of the law, they continue to practice their illegal behavior. No criminal ever expects to pay for his crime. And the fact that other criminals do does not deter him. For his ego tells him that he is not only smarter than his fellow criminals, but also that he is smarter than any policeman in the world. To protect that ego and to prevent his capture, he will sacrifice anything or anyone, be that person brother, sister, wife, or husband. There's not the slightest strain of loyalty in any criminal. Because he lives by one rule which says, do anything you want to do, but don't get caught. Tonight's file continues the following day at the Carnival Grounds. FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor is entering the office of Mr. Pomeroy, the owner of the show. Oh, come in, Mr. Taylor. Thanks, Pomeroy. Were you over in Kara's tent? Yes, I just finished a preliminary investigation. Not a great deal to investigate, was there? Well, what do you mean? Well, he sent me that note saying he was sorry, asking me to forgive him. And? Part of the stolen money, still in one of our cash wrappers, was found in one of his pockets. That's right. Carey obviously committed the robbery, got remorse, wrote me the note, then committed suicide. 
Well, it's all very logical, Mr. Pomeroy, but I don't believe any of it. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Taylor. I don't like to dispute you, but I happen to know Kara's handwriting. He did write that note. Oh, I'll concede that, but I still question the circumstances under which he wrote it. And won't you concede that he had a motive? What motive? His wife. Hmm. She was carrying on with Lancaster. Stealing the money was his chance to make himself a big man in her eyes. Hmm. Uh, am I allowed to rebuttal? Surely. Let's have it. All right. First of all, over $30,000 was stolen. Now, less than 1000 was found in Kerry's pockets. Well, he could have hidden the rest. Oh, possibly. But I have a second and even stronger point. I found an unmailed letter in Kerry's coat pocket. Yes? It was addressed to a friend in New York. In it, Kerry stated that he could not pay back the $50 he owed this man as he didn't have it. He promised to pay him as soon as he got his hands on any cash. Well? Well, that letter was written the night after your money car was robbed. Oh. Now, if Kerry really had that money, he wouldn't have written such a letter. Yeah, well, there is something to that. So, you see, uh... I want to wait for the autopsy and find out more about how Kerry died. Meantime, Mr. Pomeroy, this case is far from closed. Who's there? Me, Roy. Oh, come in, honey. Are you alone? Yeah, finally. I thought you were coming over to my tent. I couldn't. Why not? There's been 45 investigators here this morning. Including one from the FBI. Any of them suspicious? Why should they be? Well, May, after all, you and I... Shut up. I'm sorry. You know as well as I do, Roy. Frank stole the money. Then committed suicide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. May, where is the money? I've got it hidden. How are liable to search this place? I'm not worried. Look, hadn't I better keep it for a while? No. Hey, isn't it time for you to go on? Well, I've, I've cut my first show. What for? Uh, well, if you must know, I was too nervous. Why, you stupid... Look, I take chances on that motorcycle. When I got the shakes, I missed that wire. I thought you never missed. I haven't. Well? Well, I've never been mixed up in anything like this before, either. <laughs> Stop being such a baby. <laughs> go on back to your tent. I'll see you later. <laughs> Newton, I'd like to bring you up to date on that carnival case. Well, Jim, I read your report just a while ago. No. I gathered you don't hold with the suicide theory. No, sir, I don't. I agree with you. Did any more of the money turn up? No, not yet. How about the coroner? Did he make his report? Yes, that came in just a little while ago. Kerry died of poisoning, all right. Coroner gave me the name of the poison used. It's not too common. I see. Having a check made now on all drugstores to see if they've sold any in the last few days. Jim, from your report, Kerry's wife doesn't sound like too sterling a character. Well, from all I could gather, she isn't. Did you question her at all? No, no. I preferred to have her think that I went along with that suicide theory. Now I'm very glad that I did. Why is that? Well, as you saw in the report, it's common gossip around the carnival grounds that she was carrying on with a performer called the Great Lancaster. Mm Mm-hmm. He does a pretty spectacular stunt on a motorcycle. I see. Out of the best of my knowledge, a stuntman working as he does would be liable to use rosin, wouldn't you think? I would think so. Why? Well... When I sent the stolen money that was found in Kerry's pocket to our laboratory, they reported finding numerous particles of rosin in it. I'd say that ties in, Jim. Well, I... Oh, excuse me, sir. Certainly. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes. Yes, Sergeant. Well, it's a big help, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. No. Goodbye. That was police headquarters, sir. They had a report from a local drugstore. On the poison? That's right. It was bought late yesterday by a woman whose description exactly fits that of Carrie's wife. Well. I'm going back to the carnival at once. Well, Mr. Pomeroy, that's the story. I see. Has it changed your mind any about the suicide? It certainly has. And when Mrs. Carrie gets here, will you talk to her as I ask? I'll be very glad to. Fine. By the way, has Lancaster ever seen you? No. No, that's why I'm hoping this plan will work. Come in. Hello, Mr. Pomeroy. Oh, hello, Mrs. Carey. Come in. Thanks. You sent word you wanted to see me. That's right. Oh, by the way, uh, this is Mr. Taylor. Uh, Yeah, we've already met. Yes, hello, Mrs. Carey. Hello. I have sent for you, Mrs. Carey, to tell you that the case is closed. That is, all but the recovery of the money. Mr. Pomeroy, I'm terribly sorry about the whole thing. I'm sure you are. I'm sure Frank was, too. 
I'm certain that if he hadn't been drinking, he never would have stolen the money. Oh, I'm sure of that. To show you that I've forgiven him, I I want you to take his body home. Oh. He lived in Texas, didn't he? Yes. I'll arrange for your railroad tickets at once. You shouldn't do this. I insist. Now you wait right here until I make the arrangements. <laughs> My name's Taylor. Yeah? You the great Lancaster? That's right. I'm your new spieler. Oh, they're finally putting on an extra man, huh? Uh, well, I was originally hired to work for that guy who killed himself. Uh, what's his name? Carey. Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. Now that he's dead and his wife's going away, where well, there's no job there... What did you they... say? Why, I said now that he's dead... No, and... I, I mean about his wife. Oh, oh, she's going away. Where did you get that information? Oh, she was just in the main office, the... Ed Guy gave us some railroad tickets. Are you sure of that? Yeah, sure. It's for Texas. I heard her say she was going right back to her tent to pack. I guess what with her husband being dead and all, I did. Hey! Hey, where you going? Faith! Faith! What is it? I'm just in time, huh? For what? To nail you. What are you talking about? I'll stop the routine. What are you putting in those bags, laundry? No, I'm packing. I'm going to Texas. I'm taking Frank's body back home. That's a lie. You were going to run out on me. Oh, stop. As soon as I finished packing, I was going to come over and see you. As soon as you finished packing, you were going to walk out on me, and you know it. Now, why would I do that? For $30,000. 30000 that belongs to me. Stop yelling. I'll yell all I want to. I stole that money, and you're not beating me out of it. Roy, will you listen to me? I'm not running out on you. You've got to believe me. The last guy that believed you was dead. Would you shut up? Hey, you don't like to hear that, huh? You don't like to hear that you poisoned a guy. Roy, that's enough. It's too much, Mrs. What? Kelly. <laughs> you both said too much. Just as I hoped you would. What are you doing here? He's from the FBI. The... Now I'd like to start arranging for a trip for both of you. <laughs> Lancaster was sentenced to 20 years by a federal court, then turned over to state authorities who found him guilty of attempted murder and gave him a life sentence. May Carey was also turned over to state authorities and sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. Now, tonight's case in the files of your FBI was solved because of one important factor. A special agent knew in advance how the minds of two criminals would react when confronted with a given situation. That, too, is part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Your FBI has the force with which to combat force. But it has found that in many cases, the trained minds of the special agent was more than enough to protect you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Remember, fathers and mothers, the finest investment you can make for your children is an equitable education plan, an investment they can never lose regardless of inflation or deflation, an investment that enriches their personality and increases their earning power. Don't delay. See your Equitable Society representative soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Night of Terror. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Night of Terror on...
This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The program you are now hearing is one of the most popular on the air. It's listened to in millions of homes. This means that we of the Equitable Society have a very serious responsibility. We must key our Equitable Society messages to home and family problems and give our listeners real help in solving those problems. Tonight's Equitable commercial will tell about the Equitable Education Fund. If you have children, be sure to listen to this important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society coming in 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Half-Pint Horse Players. Your FBI has just completed another in its series of uniform crime reports. A study of crime and criminals throughout the 48 states. What the survey has to say about juvenile delinquency is frightening. Because this refers to no local situation, but to a national emergency. You hear of crimes such as robbery, auto theft, fraud, and forgery. And you think of them as being committed by hardened criminals with long records. And yet, the unfortunate truth, as shown by this latest FBI survey, is that almost one-third of all the crimes in those categories committed during the first half of this year were committed by boys and girls under the age of 21. Tonight's file opens in a large room in back of a pool parlor. There's a long counter against one wall behind which men are taking bets on horses. Two boys, one of them 17 and the other 15, approach the counter. Hey, Joe, that looks like the guy who runs the joint right over there. Uh Uh-huh. Let's talk to him. Okay, Phil. The first at Belmont, they got away at 1.35. They all went. Hey, you the boss here? Hmm. Yeah, why? Well, that guy down at the other end don't want to take my bet. Well, we don't bet with kids. Hey, luck, it's American money, ain't it, mister? Yeah, let me handle this, Joe. Hey, how'd you kids get in here? Through the pool room, like everybody else. Uh, go out the same way. And here comes the winner at New York. Big Dip, the winner... Happy Breed, second. Star Song, third. No prices yet. Hey, look, mister. What is it? I got a tip on this horse, and I got to get down someplace. Ah, uh, someplace else, not here. Listen, I was betting parlays when I was in grade school. He used to work for a bookmaker back home. Uh, give him your action, then. I'm telling you for the last time, get out of here. Go on, blow. Yeah, uh, come on, Joe. Right. Where are we going, Phil? Now, let's find some other place where we can make a bet. Hey, uh, fellas, uh, fellas, wait a minute. Are you calling us? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I want to talk to you. What about? Well, I uh, happened to be on the Erie when you were trying to get your bet down with Lou. Yeah, so what? So I felt sorry for you. <laughs> Thanks. Come on, Joe. Now, wait a minute. Well? Well, I'm a horse player myself. I know how it is when you got a hot horse and you can't get any action. Uh, look, if uh, you want to hang around out there in the pool room, I'll make your bets for you. Hey. Hey, that sounds okay. Now, wait a minute. What's in it for you, Mac? Well, if you have a good day, you stake me 10% of your winnings. That sounds fair enough, Phil. Eh, that's okay. A deal? A deal. Swell. Now, what do you want to bet? Well, there's 40 clams. They'll be the next two at New York. Blackjack and Dusty Lakes. 20th, 20 in reverse. 20th, 20 in reverse. You got it. Now, now, wait a minute. Huh? You give us the results as soon as they come in? Oh, sure, kid. Sure. Okay. 
Come on, Joe. Let's go on out and shoot a rack of pool, huh? Yeah, six ball in the corner. Okay, Joe, rack him up. Phil. Yeah, what? We, uh, we better stop shooting pool pretty soon. Uh, why? We won't be able to pay the time. We gave that guy our last $40. Ah, uh, don't worry, kid. We got a winner soon. Why? That system. Never goes more than four races in a row without a winner. Yeah, I know, but... Well, if we don't win this one, we got no more cash. Yeah, so what? We still got all the other stuff. I know, but that ain't cash. Hey, Joe, get out of my way. Let me take a shot. Hey, 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 wait. Here comes our guy. Oh, yeah. Hey, how do we do, Mac? Well, you blew a picture. Oh, another one? Uh-huh. Tough break. Oh, gee. This just ain't our day, Phil. Mm. Well, what do you want next, kid? I like a horse called Noble King. All right, how much you want to bet? I can't make a bet. Why not? I'm tapped out. No cash left at all? Nope. Oh, that's too bad. Well, sorry you didn't have a better day. Look, uh, if you get any fresh scratch, come back again, you hear? Now, you just ask for Charlie. That's hey, wait a minute, Charlie. I want to talk to you. Hey, look, kid, if it's about dough, I ain't holding so good myself. No, no, no. I, I don't want to put the bite on you. I want to sell you something. Huh? Yeah. Take a look at this. Hey. hey that's a real nice piece of merchandise. It's a genuine ruby. Ah, real nice. Yeah, uh, Charlie? What's it worth to you? Well, I couldn't say offhand. If you don't want to buy that, Phil, we could show him that emerald pin. Emerald pin? Yeah. Hey, what are you guys running? Teenage Tiffany's? Yeah, we got plenty of stuff like this. No kidding? Oh, sure. Uh, look, fellas. Uh, let's go over and sit down where it's nice and quiet, huh? I think we can do some business. <laughs> Not more than ten city blocks away from the pool room in a local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting a fellow agent. Hello there, Ellis. Hello, Jim. When did you get back in town? Just this morning. Uh, you all finished up on the Wilson case? Yeah. I've been assigned to the case you're working on. Hey, that's fine. I can use the help. What's the story on it, Jim? Well, a local couple named Russell were returning in their car from a vacation trip to the Middle West. Yes? Last night, about three hours outside of town, they stopped and picked up some hitchhikers. Three youngsters. I see. Shortly after the pickup, one of the youngsters pulled a gun on them. He stopped the car, ordered the couple out. The other boys tied them up, and they were left abandoned on a lonely road. And the boys drove off in the car? That's right. Where did all this happen, Jim? Across the state line, just east of Fairfield. Has uh, the car turned up yet? Yeah, it was found abandoned here in town early this morning. How much did the kids get? Well, they got about $200 in cash from Mr. Russell, but they took luggage which contained Mrs. Russell's jewelry, about $14,000 worth. Well, any descriptions? Mm-hmm, fairly good one on all three of the boys. I presume you've already sent out an alarm. Yes, I went out this morning, along with the story to the papers. I thought that the publicity might help us on this case. I see. We also gave the papers a description of the pieces of jewelry that were stolen. What about uh, fingerprints? Well, we found some around the car. We sent them down to Washington and to Fairfield. To Fairfield? Well, I didn't think we'd have those youngsters in our files in Washington. But I thought we'd take a chance that maybe they came from the town where the Russells picked them up. I see. What do we do now, Jim? I guess the only other thing left to do is go over this list of hotels and rooming houses and check on every one. Uh-huh. Here, Ellis, let's split it up and get to work. There at the post at Hawthorne. Get your bets down. Hello. Uh... Excuse me, Lou. Uh, what is it? Uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, look, Charlie, this is my busiest time of the day. Yeah, but it's important, Lou. Real important. Another touch? No, no, Lou. Honest, I swear it ain't. No, I got a proposition that can mean a lot of money to you. Uh, let's go into your office and talk, huh? Just for a minute. Well... Oh, please, Lou. Okay, come on. Ah, swell. Hey, Walt! Yeah? You handle the payoffs. I'm going into my office. Right. Go ahead, Charlie. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks. Now, um, what's your deal? Well, uh, this is a chance for the both of us to make a real bundle. How? Well, you remember those kids who came in today and wanted to bet some horses? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I got talking to them after they left here, see? And, uh, well, we talked about horses, and then we talked about money, and they said they needed dough. One of them flashed a ring. 
I bought it off them. Here, take a look at it. Hey, that looks real. It is real. Where would kids get a ring like that? Well, that's what I wondered. Then I remembered a story that was in this afternoon's paper. I just finished reading it when I met him. What about? About a stick-up out on Fairfield Turnpike. Here, here's the story. $14,000 worth of jewelry was taken. Three kids did the job. Hey, let's see that. Now, this ring is described in the story as one of the pieces that's missing. You see? Right there. Oh, yeah. Now, the kids I've been talking to are the ones that done the job. Hey, the story says, it says three kids. Yeah. yeah, well, the other one is waiting for him someplace with the rest of the jewelry. Now, here's the proposition, Lou. See, I made a deal with him. I told him I'd give him five grand for the whole lot. Well, they went for it big. Now, they're going to bring the stuff to my room tonight at seven. Hey, where are you getting five grand? I ain't really giving him five. When I get him up the room, I'm cutting him down to two. Where are you getting two? Well, I sort of figured that's where you come in. Yeah, I thought so. Well, look at the action you're getting, Lou. Fourteen thousand bucks worth. Why do you have to pay him at all? When they come up with the stuff, why don't you grab it and tell him to blow? Oh, you can't trust kids. They're liable to scream or make trouble. Lou, believe me, this is a terrific bargain. As a matter of fact, I'll see to it that we not only get the rings and stuff, but you get your two grand back, too. How? Well, I'll bring them back to the horse room. They'll bet it back with you. What do you say, Lou? Yeah. Okay. That you, Ellis? Yes, Jim. Hope you had better luck than I did. No, couldn't find any trace of those kids. Uh-huh. Anything come in while I was gone? Yes, we received word from the Fairfield police. Did they identify the three boys? Yeah, the oldest one is named Phil Osborne. He's 17. Who are the other two? The other two are brothers, Joe and Tom Sherman. I see. The Fairfield police also passed on a message from their parents. They said that if we catch the youngsters to keep them, they didn't want to be bothered with them anymore. That's nice. That's probably the reason the kids ran away in the first place. That'd be my guess. You can't raise children by remote control. It takes work. Oh, you're telling me. I've got two of my own. I work just as hard at home trying to help my kids grow up as I do here at the office. Okay. Pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yeah? He did? Yes. Yes, thanks very much, Lieutenant. Goodbye. That was Lieutenant Mitchell down at police headquarters. Yes? A special policeman at the Capitol Theater saw two boys answering to the description we sent out leaving the theater about a half an hour ago. Did he detain them? Well, he tried to, but they got away from him. Where's the special policeman now, Jim? He's waiting up at the theater. Ellis, I think I'll run up there and talk to him. Just a minute. Hiya, Charlie. Oh, hello, fellas. Come on in. Go ahead, Joe. Right. Well, you got here right on a button. Yeah. Yeah, did you bring the stuff with you? Uh-huh. Ah, where is it? Uh, Joe's got it. Yeah, it's right here in my pocket. Well, what do you say? Let's have a look at it. Oh, sure. Well, wait a minute, Joe. Huh? Just keep it in your pocket. Well, what's the matter? We want to see some money first. Well, sure, kid, Have but... you got five grand? Well... Not exactly. What do you mean? Well, I went all over town, dug up all the cash I could. The best I could raise was two. But you promised us five. I know, kid, but... No more buts. We ain't interested. Come on, Joe. Wait a minute. Well? You better change your mind. Why? I know where that stuff came from. What are you talking about? You kids did that job out in the Fairfield Turnpike. It was in the papers. Yeah, so what? So, if you don't do business with me, I blow a whistle. You turn us into the cops? That's right. Now, do we do business with two grand? You got it with you? Yeah. Let's see it. Sure. There it is. Phil, are you going to take it? Yeah. With his gun. Huh? Hey, what is this? I got a gun, wise guy. Now, let's have the dough. Come on. Drop it on the floor. Uh, what about the rings and stuff? Well, we keep them. Hey, now, look, you can't just Just get... drop that dough. I'm warning you. Drop it or I'll shoot. Phil, wait. You can't shoot. I got the bullet. Huh? Now, what do you do, big shot? I use this end of the gun. <laughs> Phil. What is it, stupid? Here's the bullets. <laughs> We will 
return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Close your eyes as you listen to one of those traditional college songs. You see the cheering section in the stadium or the group around the fire in the fraternity house. Yep, those were the days. Yes, but don't forget they were days of learning, too. And believe it or not, there's a real tie-up between learning and earning. For instance, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. And that extra $72,000 is only half the story. The well-educated man has a keener appreciation of the finer things of life, a better understanding of what makes the world go round. That's why everyone agrees that college is the best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. I hope my children will get the chance. Well, if I were you, Don, I wouldn't leave it to chance. Why not make sure they'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And it includes these important features. One... You start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payment. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Oh, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Half-Pint Horse Players. Any edition of your local newspaper will bring you fresh evidence of the fact that juvenile delinquency is one of the most pressing problems facing the nation today. Barely a day passes but that some new crime is reported that was committed by a boy or girl so young that the community is momentarily shocked into trying to fight the problem. But half-hearted measures or whole-hearted temporary measures are not the answer. The answer to juvenile delinquency lies in the home of every child, where the problem starts. As has been said in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, it takes work to raise children. But only by investing that work can you parents of America help fight the number one law enforcement problem of the nation. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from his visit to the theater. Well, Ellis, the special policeman didn't have anything to add to what we got from headquarters. Too bad. Did you see these? What's that? This set of character notes on the three boys that came in from the Fairfield Police. No, no. What's it say? Well, one of them, Phil Osborne, he's the oldest, is a horse player. At 17? Yeah. Joe Sherman, the 15-year-old, is a tremendous eater. And according to Fairfield, he's not too bright. He can't be to get mixed up in something like this. The third boy, Joe's brother, Tom, is a movie fan. No? He's been known to stay in a movie house for ten hours at a stretch. Oh, I get it. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. What's that address again? Uh, Just a minute while I write it down. Hand me a pencil. Thanks. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I've got it. 37 South 15th. Thanks again, Lieutenant. This may be something else. What's that, Jim? That was Lieutenant Mitchell again. They just had a report that two young boys answering the descriptions we sent out assaulted a man in a furnished room. Who made the report to the police? Man's landlady. He's still in his room. Come on, let's get over there and talk to him. Mr. Brown? That's right. My name is Taylor. This is Mr. Anderson. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Ah, I see. Well... What do you want? Your landlady reported to the police that you were assaulted here early this evening. That's right. Who did it? 
two boys. They said they were messengers when they came to the door. When I let them in, they knocked me out. I see. What do you know about the boys, Mr. Brown? Nothing. I never saw them before. Look, my landlady shouldn't have bothered busy men like you with something like this. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, now, why don't you just forget about the whole thing and let me go back to bed? Huh? My head hurts. You say you never saw these boys before. And that you didn't know they were coming here? That's right. That's not the truth. Huh? You told your landlady at 6.30 that you were expecting two boys to call on you. And uh, let them right up to your room when they came. Ah, she's crazy. Mr. Brown, before we ask you any more questions, may I see that ring you're wearing? Huh? Oh, uh... Well, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to get off. Oh, that's all right. I'll look at it right on your hand. Where'd you get this ring? Uh, my, uh, my father left it to me. It's been the family for years. I hate to tell you that you're lying again, but this ring is part of the loot from a job that was pulled last night on the Fairfield Turnpike. I'm telling you, it was my father's ring. Now look, Brown, let's start all over again. And this time, let's try and tell the truth. <laughs> Joe, we're in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, we got two G's in cash. And we still got the jewelry. Uh-huh. Hey, you know what we do tomorrow? Nope. We hop a train, go to New York. And we can go to the movies, the races. Bill. Huh? I wish I was home. What? I, I mean it. Look at us. We got $2,000 and we can't even get a place to sleep in a hotel. But I told you, the cops will be watching every hotel. That's why I... I wish I was home, Phil. Ah, oh, come on. I used to have plenty to eat when I was home, Phil. You don't let me eat unless you're hungry. I ate too much. But I like to eat. I like to sleep, too. I could sleep at home whenever I wanted to. Now, look, Joe, your brother's waiting for us at the Capitol Theater. You can sleep there, okay? Only till about 12 o'clock. Look, it's open all night. Well, I'll sleep there tonight. And then tomorrow morning, the three of us go to New York. Ellis? Yes, Jim? I think Brown is ready to tell us the truth now. Aren't you, Brown? Yeah. All right, now let's have the whole story. How did you meet the boys? Well, they came to Lou Thomas's horse room to make a bet. Mm. I was there, and I picked them up. I see. And did you know who they were? No, not at first. But when one of them offered to sell me the ring, I remembered the description of the ring in a paper. You bought this ring from them? Yeah, for 50 bucks. Then I made a deal with them to buy everything they had. Where were you going to get the money? Well, Lou Thomas, the guy with the horse room, went in with me. He put up the money. Thomas knew what the money was to be used for? Sure. He was my partner. I see. Go on. What happened then? Well, then I made a date with the kids to buy their stuff from them 7 o'clock tonight. And they came up here and held you up? That's right. How much did they get? 2,000 bucks. Brown, have you any idea where they might have gone when they left here? Well, I wasn't altogether knocked out when they left. I, I think I heard one kid say they were going back to the movies to meet his brother. That'd be the third boy, Ellis. They didn't say what movie, did they? No, they didn't. Okay, Brown, get your coat. What for? We want you to come down to the office with us. Okay. What do we do about this man, Lou Thomas, Jim? Want to put up the 2,000? Yes. He's implicated, and we'll have him picked up. Why those dirty little crooks? What's the matter? Oh, one of them punks took my sport coat and left this dirty leather jacket. Here, let me look through that jacket. How do you like those guys? What thieves? Find anything, Jim? Yeah, I don't know how much help it's going to be, though. Three ticket stubs from the Capitol Theater. That's where they went today. Yes, that's right. Ellis, let's take Brown down to the office, and then let's go see a movie. See a movie? At this time of night? That's right. Come on, let's go. <laughs> We come upon many rare and beautiful specimens of the orchid. Nowhere in the world are so many different varieties to be found. And they constitute one of the main sources of export revenue. Jim. Yeah? Jim, you think we ought to ask the manager to throw on the house lights? No, I don't think that'll be necessary, Ellis. We should be able to spot them if they're here. It's a pretty small audience. Here? You see them being packed. Why don't you look up in the balcony while you work the orchestra? Hey, that's a pretty good idea. Go ahead. In two days, they'll be in your florist's window. Alice, Alice, wait a minute. What is it, Jim? 
Take a look at those three kids sitting down there. Yeah, they look like the ones we're looking I'm for. I'm sure it's him. Come on, let's get down there. And so you see how much the airplane has meant to the economy of Panaloa. Jim, I don't know how you figured they'd come back to the Capitol Theater. You remember how many ticket stubs there were in that leather jacket? Yes, three. That meant that all three of them came in here today. But the special policeman only saw two of them come out. See, that's right. Then there was one other thing. Remember in the notes from the Fairfield police, they said that one boy was a movie fan and could sit and watch the same movie for ten hours? Oh, of course. All of the Panaloans are expert sailors, of course. And this canoe racing is their main sport. It takes two years to build one of these canoes. But once built, they are sturdy enough to last a lifetime. Hello, boys. Huh? You're Joe and Tom Sherman? Yeah, that's right. That other boy there is Phil Osborne? Yeah. Be quiet, you dope. Who are you? What Special do you want? Special agent of the FBI. What? Now, don't raise your voices. You're coming along with us. Come on. Yeah, but you don't now, understand. No arguments. Come on, boys. And so, with the last beautiful glimpse of the sunset sinking into the bay, we say farewell to the beautiful island of Panaloa. <laughs> Bill Osborne and the two Sherman brothers were committed to reformatories until they are 21 years of age under the Federal Juvenile Delinquency Act. Lou Thomas and Charles Brown were sentenced to three and five years, respectively, for violating the National Stolen Property Act. And thus, three young boys were halted in their careers of crime by your FBI and given fresh chances to straighten out their lives and to become decent citizens. Every child deserves that chance. And the fact that there are as many juvenile delinquents as there are is not the fault of the children themselves, but of the adult population. When the parents of America face that fact honestly and try to do something about it, then and only then will the most important step have been taken. Law enforcement agencies like your FBI fight juvenile delinquency with every facility at their disposal. But they cannot hope to win their fight without support. Support from you, the parents of America. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Fathers and mothers, the sure way to increase your child's chances of success in the future is to start an equitable education fund now. Remember, the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. So don't delay. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case in the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case that emphasizes the inherent viciousness of the professional criminal. Its subject, interstate theft. Its title, The Friendly Frame-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The friendly frame-up on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At this exact moment, your home is one of many millions in which this radio program is tuned in. 
In the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we feel that this nationwide home listening carries with it a very serious responsibility. Our Equitable Radio message must be keyed to home and family problems. Tonight's Equitable Society message is on education. If there are children in your home, you'll be particularly interested in this commercial about the Equitable Education Fund. Don't miss it in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. It is a truism in law enforcement circles that no criminal is easy to catch. Each one presents a new problem, demanding a new approach. Some, of course, are easier to apprehend than others. It is simpler to bring to justice the criminal who lives by crime alone, who earns no honest dollar than it is to trap the species of lawbreakers among us, who live a Jekyll and Hyde existence, who operate a legitimate business as a front and a criminal business undercover. Those people are difficult to weed out because for the most part they take no active role in the commission of any crime. Mainly, they are the brains and the money behind the operation of a complex criminal machine. A machine which is built to stop at nothing. Tonight's file opens in a smoke-filled gymnasium. Sweaty fighters are going through their training workouts. One shadow boxing, one working with a sparring partner in the ring, another punching the heavy bag. It's 11 o'clock in the morning as Pete Webb, who manages these fighters, walks through the gym to his office. Work, Lefty. Keep going. Okay. Nice footwork, Jackie. Simulator, will you? Right. Hey, Mr. Webb. Uh, Hi, Buffalo. Uh, no time for you now, kid. Catch me in an hour, huh? Okay. Louie. Right with you. Louie! Call back later, will you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Bye. Good morning, boss. Who was that? Bob Hudson. What do you want? The job. Was he kidding? Bob thinks just because I managed him, he was, when he was fighting, I should support him for the rest of his life. Let him drop dead. What's coming this morning? Little Danny's in the jug. Where'd you get that? Yancey was in. He just visited Danny, got the whole story. What happened? Well, Danny said he met a guy on a train coming east. What kind of a guy? A bond salesman. Danny got him loaded, and the guy spilled that he was carrying some bonds. Uh-huh. Well, it's perfect for Danny. He's always got those go-to-sleep pills in his kick. So he slipped some in the guy's drink and clipped his briefcase. Well, what went wrong? Well, the guy must have come too awful fast. He quick contacted the cops. They called Danny in the station? No. Uh, not till he hit his apartment. What about the bonds? Well, Danny was afraid he might have a tail on him, so as soon as he hit the railroad station, he checked the briefcase of the baggage counter. Uh-huh. Then he put the claim check in an envelope and dropped it in the mailbox. Who'd he mail it to? Well, that's what Yancey came up to tell us. Danny mailed the claim check to you. No. Did it come in? No, Danny Free, we should get it this afternoon. Then he wants for you to get rid of the bonds and get some cash to him for a mouthpiece. I see. Uh, where did he check this time? North Side Station. Well, when the baggage checks him, then you run over there and pick the stuff up. Me? Yeah. Are you kidding? No, why? There's liable to be 50 cops waiting around that baggage counter. You just told me that he wasn't picked up till he hit his apartment. All right, he could have talked since then. Mm, Daddy wouldn't talk. Then why don't you pick the stuff up? Well, uh... Well, for the same reason I got, huh? Look, we just can't leave the stuff there. It's too good a score for us. We gotta get some... Wait a minute. What? I got an idea. <laughs> Ellie. Yes, Bob. Where are you, honey? I'm in the bedroom. Okay. You're home early, honey. Any luck today? Yeah, I got a job. Oh, Bob, that's wonderful. Oh, I'm so excited. Wait a minute, honey. Don't get too excited. Why not? Well, wait till you hear who I'm working for. Who? Pete Webb. Oh, no, Bob. Well, Ellie, I had to find a job. Yeah, but not with Pete. 
Bob, how could you after the things that he's done to you? I know what he's done to me, but we also have to eat. But, Bob, there are plenty of guys that... For two solid months now, I've been pounding the pavement looking for work. I know, but... I found out real quick about my friends. They turned out to be a lot of guys who only wanted to be around while I was winning. But other people... Other people? Well, I take one look at this nose and these cauliflower ears and practically come right out and tell me they're not interested in hiring a punch-drunk fighter. That's why I finally called Pete. I understand, honey. I'm sorry. It's okay. What are you going to do for Pete? I don't know, but I told him no larceny. What did he say? He said the job was clean. When did he start work? This afternoon. I got to pick up something for him. What? A package that's checked at Northside Station. The same afternoon in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching his desk. Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, Paul. I've been looking for you. Huh? I just left the boss. He's put us both on a case that just came in. Oh? What are the details of it? A man named Lawrence Black was on a train en route here from Cleveland. He was robbed of $21,000 of negotiable bonds. Oh, how was the job done? The thief slipped some knockout drops into one of Black's drinks. I see. When he came to, he gave the police at the station a good description of the man he was drinking with. Uh Uh-huh. The description was so good, in fact, that the local police picked up the thief within an hour as he was entering his apartment. Oh, wait, Paul, if they picked him up, what's the case? What are we working on? The thief didn't have the bonds on him. Oh, I see. I presume the police searched his apartment. From top to bottom. But there wasn't a trace of either the bonds or the briefcase they were in. Well, are the police sure they've got the right man? The victim made a positive identification. Mm, I see. Jim, our job is to find out what he did with those bonds between the time he got off the train and the time he got home. Okay. Who's the thief, Paul? His name is Newton. He has a long criminal record. Newton, huh? Hey, what's his first name? Dan. Dan Newton? That's right. Hey, that could be little Danny. Paul, have you got anything on him here? A description, maybe? Got a whole file right here. Pictures and all. Oh, swell. You have a look at it, huh? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's little Danny, all right. You know him, Jim? Yes. Yes, and I think I know where the bonds are. Really? Yes, you see, little Danny has always used a regular pattern of operation. He rides trains, picks up a victim, clips him, then checks his loot at the railroad station as soon as he gets off. But, Jim, there was no baggage check found on him when he was picked up. No, no, there wouldn't be. His usual procedure is to mail the check either to himself or to a friend. Paul, what station did he arrive in? The North Side Station. Let's notify the police and have them send a man to that baggage counter at once. <laughs> Hey, bud, how about that bag? I gave you the check five minutes ago. Look, can I get some service here? Oh, brother. Hey, hey, you, is that the briefcase? Yeah. Well, it's about time. Let me have it. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hmm? Huh? You better let me have that briefcase. Who are you? Police. Here's the badge. What is this? Just give me the briefcase, Hudson. How do you know me? I used to watch you fight. Now, let's have the bag and come along with me. What for? This is an arrest. Hmm? I got to take you in. Look, I don't get any of this. You just claimed that briefcase. Well, so what? I'm picking it up for the guy I worked for. Hudson, that briefcase was stolen. Hmm? There's $21,000 worth of negotiable bonds in there. Well, wait. There must be some mistake. There's no mistake. I know the briefcase, and I've been waiting an hour to nail whoever picked it up. Whoever picked it up? Yeah. Now, come on. Wait a minute. I'm being framed. Come on, I said. Oh, no. Let go of me. Hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. Hudson, you hear me? Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. I'm down at the railroad station. We've gotten a bad break. Oh, what's that, Paul? A man picked up the briefcase about ten minutes ago. An officer attempted to arrest him, but he got away. With the briefcase? Yes. Oh, that is tough. The police feel they can pick him up pretty quickly, though. How's that? The arresting officer recognized the man. Said his name was Bob Hudson, ex-prize fighter. Yeah, I've heard of him. Hudson was wounded in the getaway. The officer fired two shots at him. He certainly hit him at least once. Any idea where this Hudson lives? The police are checking that now. Paul, have them call me as soon as they find his address. Yeah, honey. 
Bob. Bob, what's wrong? Just let me sit down a minute. Look at your shirt. That's blood. Yeah. Tell him what's happened. A bullet grazed my shoulder. Well, I'll call a doctor. Wait. No doctors, Ellie. Huh? The guy with the gun was a cop. Oh. I was framed, Ellie. Pete Webb framed me. Oh, no, darling. How? What bag I was to call for at the railroad station. It was loaded with stolen bonds. $21,000 worth. And he sent you there knowing that? Sure. Hoping I'd get away clear. Oh, this is awful. Oh, you were right about Pete, honey. I shouldn't have taken that job. Oh, forget about that. Why did the cops shoot you? Well, it was going to take me in. I couldn't let Pete's frame go that far, so I busted away from him. Bob, you shouldn't have done that. Pete was in the wrong, not you. Well, I can never prove that from the city jail. Bob, you just got to let me call the doctor. I said no, Ellie. But I can't Look, just... I wouldn't be here anyway when he came. What do you mean? I got a call to make. What? I'm going to go see Pete Webb. <clears throat> I'm going right now. Oh, Bob, please listen to me. Your shoulder... It... The bleeding stopped. But you, you've got to let Ellie, me do... Ellie, I'm going to go see Pete Webb, and I'm going to make him come down to the cops with me and tell the real story about those stolen bonds. Uh, just a minute. Hello, Louie. Hiya, Bob. Come on in. Pete, it's Bob Hudson. Oh, hiya, kid. Hello, Pete. What took you so long? I was beginning to get a little worried about you. No kidding. Hey, what's with the blood? In my shirt? Yeah. What happened? I got shot. Huh? By who? Cop. What for? You should know what for, Pete. I don't get you. The briefcase. The briefcase that you framed me into picking up. Oh, I sent you on an errand, that's all. Well, stop I... the routines. Hey, where is the briefcase? I haven't got it. The cops get it? No. Well, where is it? I put it away in a safe place. It's going to stay there until I take both you guys and the bonds to the cops. You're going to take us to the cops? That's right. <laughs> Pete, this guy really is punchy. You did frame me. You've got to admit that. Yeah. I admit it. But only to you, not the cops. I was just paying you back for an old score. What do you mean? The time you double-crossed me in Bay City. I never double-crossed anybody in my life. Remember the time I had you in a main at Bay City? I bet against you. I told you about it. You turn around and win the fight. I've tried to win every fight. You're in one now, you ain't gonna win. Oh, no. I'm taking you both to the cops right now. Hold the phone. Hmm? This gun says different. That ain't stopping me, Louie. That's what you think. No guns, Louie. This is better. Ooh. Louie, uh, yeah. take this blackjack. When he comes to, keep using it on him till you find out where he stashed that briefcase. Well, okay, boss. Where you going? I want some action. I'm going to the fights. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Tomorrow on hundreds of football fields, boys and girls will raise their voices in the old traditional songs. The same songs you and I sang in our college days. Well, college wasn't all singing for me, Mr. Keating. I had a swell time, but I took medicine and studied pretty hard at it. Of course you studied, Harry. And there are hundreds of thousands of others just like you. That's why the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. What's more, that extra $72,000 is just half the story. Educated men and women have cultural interests and appreciation that they wouldn't part with for any amount of money. So, for many reasons, everyone agrees college is the wisest and best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. Well, I certainly hope that my boy will get the chance to go. If I were you, I wouldn't leave it a chance. Why not make sure he'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? Never heard of it before. It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this Equitable plan works whether you live or die. 
If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates one major point. A point which cannot be stressed too strongly or repeated too often. It is absolutely impossible for a decent law-abiding citizen to do business with a criminal. The two cannot mix any more successfully than oil and water. Because their minds and their hearts are so different. The decent man lives by the credo that he must work for what he gets, and that his fellow man is entitled to the same courtesy and dignity that he himself expects in return. But the criminal regards his fellow men as just so many potential victims, and he looks with contempt on those who work for what they want. Your FBI asks you to remember those things if you're ever tempted to enter into any agreement with a criminal. Remember them and heed them well. Tonight's file continues that same evening at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned to his office where Special Agent Meriden is waiting for him. Hello, Paul. Any word from the police on Hudson? Not since I've been here, Jim. Had any dinner yet? No, the drugstore's going to send up a sandwich and some coffee. That'll hold me for a while. The note you left for me said you went to Hudson's house. What happened? Oh, his wife was there. When I questioned her, she told me that Hudson had been given a job just this afternoon by his old manager, Pete Webb. Pete Webb? Yes. Webb's a local character who's on the shady side, but nobody's ever been able to get anything on him. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Hudson says that Webb sent her husband for the briefcase. Did he know what was in it? Well, she said no. She said that Hudson returned to the house wounded this afternoon after he'd been at the station and that he'd gone from there to Webb's apartment. What for? To make Webb go to the police with him and admit that the whole thing was a frame. I see. So I left Hudson's and went over to Webb's apartment. Yes. Webb had gone out to the fights, according to a stooge of his named Louis Slater, who answered the door. Louis Slater? Hmm. Where do I know that name from? Oh, he's a petty larceny hoodlum. He said he'd heard of Hudson, but that he didn't know him, and that Hudson had positively never been to Webb's apartment. I don't trust people who are so positive. Neither do I, Paul, but I didn't have a search warrant, so there wasn't much I could do except take his word for it. I'll, I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Spencer down at headquarters. Oh, hello, Spencer. We've got Hudson again. Hmm? And this time he won't break loose. Where'd you find him? He was unconscious in an alley off Main Street and First Avenue. He's over at City Hospital now. Still unconscious? According to last reports, he was. In fact, the doctors say they don't know if he'll ever come out of it. Oh. Well, thanks very much, Spencer. Right. Bye. Hudson is at City Hospital, unconscious, Paul. Come on, let's get up there. Thought you were going to wait for me at the apartment. Yeah, I was, but something important came up. I came to tell Don't you... Don't tell me nothing this round's over. Come on, sailor. Come on, boy. Get in there now. Keep the left out there. Get... Now, what have you got? A guy from the FBI was around. He was looking for Hudson. What'd you tell him? I said I didn't even know the guy. Good. What'd you do with Hudson. I dumped him in an alley. Alive? Yeah, just about. That's bad. Look, you didn't say nothing about knocking him off. Okay, okay. Did you find out where you put the stuff? Yeah, I think so. What do you mean, fake? Well, he never came to after you conked him. So I frisked him and I found this key. What is it? Well, it fits one of those subway locker boxes. It says so right here. Uh, I figured it's probably a box on that station near where Hudson lives. 
Yeah, the key's got a number on it. Well, we can check. That's a good idea. Uh, look, Louie, why don't you go up and see if you're right? Are you kidding? No. Look, that's how Hudson got where he is. Look, Louie, I want to watch this fight. I'll see you at the gym in the morning. Hi, Jim. Oh. How is he? Oh, he's still unconscious. They patched up the bullet wounds, but somewhere Hudson took an awful beating. After he was shot? Must have been. You think he got the beating at Webb's place? Mm -hmm. Could be. I checked on what time Webb got to the fights tonight. He'd have had time to see Hudson and still get to the arena when he did. Hudson didn't have the bonds on him when they found him, did he? Uh -huh. His pockets were empty, Paul. What did the doctor think of Hudson's chances? Oh, 50-50. He might pull out of it, but there's no telling. Uh oh comes his wife now. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Mrs. Hudson. The nurse told me you spoke to the doctor. Yes, that's right. How is he? Is he going to get better? Well, Mrs. Hudson, it'll be a little while, probably, before the doctors know any more than they do now. Here comes one of them now, Jim. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that's him. That's Bob's doctor? Yes. He's coming over here. Well, now, be calm, Mrs. Hudson. It'll... It's bad news. I, I know it. I can see it in the doctor's face. Oh, Bob! <laughs> Hey, Tiger, peek him in his office yet? Yeah, he's in. Thanks. That's you, Louie? Uh-huh. Pete, I got some news for you. What is it? Well, you were worried about me not knocking off Hudson, huh? Uh-huh. He died this morning in the hospital. How do you know? I heard the rumor from a dozen guys, so I called the hospital. I see. They said it was official, and he also told me he'd die without ever coming to. That means he couldn't tell the cops where he stashed the bonds. Oh, that's right. Uh, where's that locker key? Right here in my kick. Where do you think we should start looking? Like I said last night, we go first to the subway station near where Hudson lived. Okay, let's go. <laughs> The locker should be down at this end of the platform. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. What is it? It's a train coming. Oh. It's an express, Pete. It ain't, it ain't stopping. Uh -huh. Well, come on. Louis, that looks like the locker's down there. Yeah. Now let's just hope they got number 2177. We'll just walk by the lockers and take a gander at the numbers as we pass. Okay. Hmm. Do you see what I see? Good old number 2177. Uh -huh. Let's go to work. Here's the key. Okay. Fits, huh? Yeah. There we are. What's in there? Just what we're looking for. A briefcase. Oh, swell. Let's open it up, huh? Not here, stupid. Come on, let's get going. Wait. What is it? That guy coming toward us. He's the guy from the FBI. You sure? Yeah. Let's round and make the other exit quick. There you are, both of you. Not a chance. Oh, oh they're coming your way. I see them. Wait, Pete, we're blocked off. All right, you two, don't move. Nice going, Paul. All right, Webb. Let's have that briefcase. What is this? I don't think I have to explain. Well, Paul, let's call the hospital as soon as we can. Hudson will be happy to know we picked these men up. Hudson's dead. You just heard a rumor that he was dead. I planted that rumor with a fight mob. I hoped it to get back to you. But the hospital said he was dead. They were instructed to say that. Hudson's not only alive, but he told us where the bonds were. He also told us that you probably had the missing key. This is nothing but lies. I think you'll change your mind when Hudson's testimony sends you both away for a long, long time. Uh -huh. 
Pete Webb and his henchman, Louis Slater, were tried in a federal court and given 20 years for violating the National Stolen Property Act. They were then turned over to local authorities and sentenced to an additional long term for attempted murder. And thus, your FBI performed a double function in tonight's case. First, they apprehended the guilty criminals. And second, they proved the innocence of an accused man. It's the everyday job of special agents to arrest the violators of certain federal laws. And the story of their success in that job is in their record and in their reputation. But the second function performed in tonight's case is even more important. Because the basic foundation of good law enforcement must be public confidence. The knowledge that the public has that it will not be victimized in order to build up an impressive record of convictions. That each individual questioned will be treated as innocent until he is proven guilty. That is why every special agent is instructed when he is appointed a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that the primary job of your FBI is to protect the American people and that a major part of that protection is seeing to it that no innocent man be found guilty of a crime he did not commit. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about the Equitable Education Fund. The outstanding feature of this plan is this. It makes sure that your children will be educated no matter what happens. Whether you live or die, they'll get the education you want them to have. So don't wait any longer. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that graphically illustrates the fate of a supposedly honest businessman who chooses to consort with thieves. Its subject, fraudulent bankruptcy. Its title, Merchants of Arson. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adopted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Merchants of Arson, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.